evening, everyone. This is absolutely wonderful to have all of you here tonight. This is a fantastic turnout with lots and lots of intelligent people. I want to welcome you on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Washington County. I happen to be the president, but this was put on by a number of uh, efforts from within the League and other organizations. So I want to mention that not only is the League a sponsor of this event, but the Omni Center of Peace, Justice, and Ecology, the Ozark Headwaters Group of the Sierra Club, and Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light. Thank you very much for your sponsorship. Let's give them a <laughs> We are thrilled tonight to talk about Shale and Wall Street with Deborah Rogers. And Joyce Hale, who is at the heart of this event, would like to make the introduction. So thank you, Joyce. <laughs> It is very nice to see everyone turn out tonight. As you start listening and learning more and more about what is being talked about tonight, it's going to be a little different in that normally you hear things from the environmental perspective. Now we are talking about it from the economic and finance end. And this is so critical because it affects all of us much more than a situation where people think, well, I don't live in the shale area, so it doesn't involve me as much. This visit with Deborah Rogers tonight is going to put the whole issue in your lap. And I hope that you really will start learning more. About two years ago, I first became familiar with some of the work that Deborah Rogers was doing. And of course, for someone who had been in the trenches trying to educate the public, this was absolute manna from the heaven. Because we all need the information that is researched, that has a good focus, very pointedly, on what they're trying to say. And her materials always targeted very clearly and with language that all of us could understand what needed to be learned. So I've learned a great deal from this woman. When you get to a point in working in any kind of controversial area, you will be able to measure the level of your success by the people who criticize you. <coughs> because until you start making an impact, you really can't tell if they're even paying attention. <laughs> and so having been a fortunate person to receive the name Frankenstein <laughs> by one of our leading companies. I take great pleasure in introducing to you the mother of all shale gas spin. <laughs> and this is Deborah Rogers. That's so funny. Um, that was an industry uh, group called Energy and Debt that, that they, that's what they said, that I was the mother of all spin. Um, I am delighted to be back in Arkansas. I love Arkansas. I've been coming here since I was a tiny little girl. My parents first brought me here to go camping. When, and I don't even, I mean, these were some of my first memories. So I've always had a, a soft spot in my heart for Arkansas. And it was just lovely flying in last night and seeing it. I always forget how beautiful it is until I see it again. So thank you for having me. I am going to cover a tremendous amount of information in a very short period of time. Can you hear me okay? It seems like I'm so I'm going to cover a lot of information. I'm going to cover it very quickly. Uh, and, but then I'm going to open it up to questions and answers. And please, um, you know, I will stand here tonight until you have your very last question. I will give as much time to this as you want me to. Um, so with, let's get started. I am of the opinion that shales should have come unraveled shortly after the economic downturn in 2008. The reason they didn't is because the large Wall Street investment banks, and by these I refer to them as the usual suspects, the Goldman Sachs, the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, etc. They mm -hmm. saw an opportunity essentially to substitute shales for mortgage-backed securities, derivatives, and other financial products that were based on mortgage-backed securities, or mortgage-backed financial products. And they used essentially the same playbook, which was rather interesting. You may recall that in, when the banks were selling derivatives, there were a number of things that they did. They used off-balance sheet financing. They bundled mortgages. They sold securities to people who weren't sophisticated enough to understand. They reverse-engineered products uh, to meet rating agencies' higher standards. 
you will see that in shales, they've essentially done the same thing. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Barclays Capital Executive. He actually won an, uh, an award from Risk Magazine, which is a mergers and acquisition magazine, um, quite well known within the financial industry. And he is essentially stating here uh, what I just went over. He said, the main challenges in putting together the Chesapeake VPP deal, and by the way, VPP is a, a form of off-balance sheet financing called volumetric production payment in Chesapeake Energy as others, but they in particular were very fond of these products. Um, we're getting the structure right and guiding the ratings agencies and institutional investors who did not necessarily have a deep familiarity with the energy business. Now, I have a problem with this because those institutional investors that he's referring to are pension funds. That means people's retirement monies were going into investments that the people who were in charge of these funds didn't really understand. Um, the difference here, as you're going to see as we go along, is that these banks, instead of keeping the toxic assets on their own books, which is what they did with mortgage-backed securities, and they learned their lesson. These are clever boys, um, and girls, but primarily boys. Um, they learned their lesson, and they this time used the same playbook, and um, but let the, the oil and gas companies keep the toxic assets on their, their books, which was as you will see, it will be much better for the banks, and but not so good for the shale companies. Now, um, as you will recall, will recall, the banks also bundled mortgages. Well, in, in the case with shales, they bundled leases. And shale plays actually became uh, land grabs. That was the primary business and has been the primary business of shale plays. They would go in and offer a farmer sometimes $500, um, sometimes more in my area, in, when it got into the urban areas in Fort Worth, the, the leasing costs actually went up to $30,000 an acre. That was most unusual. Stayed there for a very short period of time and then dropped back down. But primarily they were offering about $500 an acre, sometimes as much as $1,000. Those are, that's about the average that people have been offered in every shale play across the U.S. And then they were turning around, drilling a handful of wells and pronouncing the entire play uh, proved up, and I'll go into more detail on that in a moment. And they were flipping it to other investors within the oil and gas industry for as much as $25,000 an acre. So you can see this was a very lucrative business for these companies. Um, this is a quote, uh, Chesapeake Energy CEO Aubrey McClendon was actually bragging to financial analysts about this, and he, he says unequivocally, I can assure you that buying leases for X and selling them for five to ten times X is a lot more profitable than trying to produce gas. And he says at five to six dollars in MCF, we haven't seen gas at five to six dollars in MCF in quite some time, since about maybe 2009, 2010. So a lot of people within the industry have accused me of being a conspiracy theorist. They, they say, well, that's a very nice conspiracy, conspiracy theory, Deborah. Well, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I believe in math. And the math is actually very, very simple indeed. All you have to do to figure out where the price is going or was going I spotted this back in, in early 2010, was these production targets up here in the top line. That is a primary metric for oil and gas companies. And um, if you're an analyst, the first thing you want to hear from an oil and gas company is, I have met your production target. And what they mean is, we have grown our production X percentage year over year, and that means that the company is healthy, they're finding new um, oil and gas deposits, and they're bringing them to market. So. It's, a, it's one of the very first metrics and one of the very um, primary metrics that analysts look for and investors as well. So these companies are going to do pretty much everything they can. They're going to jump through any hoop they can in order to meet these targets because if they don't meet them, then that analyst will in turn downgrade their stock and that they don't have as much money available to them or the money is more expensive uh, for them. So you take existing production and then you add those production targets onto it and that's going to let you know how much gas you're going to have or oil. You can go out 12, 24 months in advance based on these production targets. And then I looked at what the current demand was in the U.S. and I could tell that, that we were going to have a significant surplus in natural gas. Now, when you have a surplus, that, that equals glut. And if you have a glut, prices go in one direction and one direction only. So it was very clear that prices were going to start trending down. The large investment banks saw that as an opportunity. 
And they turned around to the majors, the Exxon Mobiles, the Shells, Chevrons, and so forth of the world, who had never been interested in shales because they said in the early days, we can't make this work, and we, we were not, the gas isn't there, and we can't make the numbers work. And they were never interested in shales. But now, because the SEC had also changed a rule for oil and gas, uh, and I'm going to get into that in more detail in just a moment, but they had changed the rule for oil and gas in 2009. And basically they stated that you could now um, add shale reserves onto your books and so you could expand your reserve base. And that's also a metric that analysts look for because they want to see if you have, um, it looks like your reserves are growing, then again it looks like your company is healthier and, and, um, and you're, you're financially more healthy. So when they, they turned around to the majors, these investment banks, and they said, you can now go in because the price is dropping. Um, you can go in and we can help you facilitate these deals and um, you can pick them up for cents on the dollar. This is the price of natural gas in 2008, about $8. As that price started to fall, the value of the mergers and acquisitions deals in shales went up significantly. It went up from $15 billion in 2008 to $50 billion in 2009. 38, 47, and in 2012 it was like another 56 billion. Um, that is an interesting correlation because that translates into very, very significant fees for these banks. And as it turned out, amazingly enough, imagine this, uh, shales turned out to be the number one profit center for a lot of these large Wall Street banks. It took over the, the space left from the mortgage-backed securities. So they just transferred one basically toxic asset for another and made a whole lot of money doing that. Um, so, do I have a problem with investment bankers making uh, large fees off investment deals? No. Investment banking is a very critical part of our financial system and it's a very needed part. Uh, what I have a problem with is that these banks um, went in and facilitated these deals and there's no way, I can tell you having worked in that business for a number of years, there's absolutely no way that you could do proper due diligence on any of these deals and not know that those underlying assets were not performing properly. And indeed, that's what happened. These, um, within a matter of months, the deals that the banks had made a whole lot of money off of in generating fees went south on the buyers. Uh, the one that you're going to be probably most familiar with is this one, BHP Billiton. And they went in and bought all of Chesapeake Energy's Fayetteville shale assets. They paid about $4 billion for them. And 18 months later, only 18 months later, they wrote off over 50% of what they paid for. Them. You see, these are all asset write downs. In Canada, 1.7 billion, Quicksilver, 2 billion, BP, 2.1. And these numbers have grown since then, by the way. Chesapeake is now up to, I think, 3.5 billion, 3.4, something like that. Even now, the majors are even now taking large, large asset write downs on US shale assets. Uh, in the last quarter, um, both Shell and ExxonMobil announced uh, huge write-downs. Shell took about $2 billion in a write-down, and Peter Vosser, who's just now stepping down, about to step down as CEO of Shell, um, gave an interview to the London Financial Times last week in which he stated that one of the things he regrets most about his tenure as CEO of Shell was his investment in U.S. shale assets. Shell, by the way, is planning to sell at least 50% of their assets off over the next year or two. Um, and ExxonMobil took a 60% hit to earnings from their shale assets. Now, when you get companies that are this size of the ExxonMobil's of the world, um, and they can take a 60% hit to assets off of, off of shale assets, then you know you've got a real problem um, with the underlying well performance in production. Fragonomics. So let's go into kind of the background and, and What's actually going on with shales and why aren't they what the industry has purported them to be? I, I, by the way, I wish I'd, I'd coined this, frame, this phrase, but I didn't. It came from the London Financial Times, but I, I've always loved it, so I had to make a slide for it. <laughs> so, why are shales so hyped? I think it's because of competition. Um, you don't hear a lot about this yet. You will start to hear more and more, but you don't hear a lot about it yet in the mainstream financial press. And that is what's going on with what they call the clean economy and clean investments. And by that, I mean large-scale wind and solar, um, geothermal, um, 
there, there are quite a number of things that encompass that. But the clean economy, believe it or not, during the economic downturn grew at 8.3%. So it was robust during the economic downturn. I can also tell you that you actually have deals being um, put together right now as we speak and, and even in the last year uh, involving people like MetLife or, or institutions like MetLife and people like Warren Buffett um, who are putting significant amounts of money into renewable projects and believe it or not they're locking in double digit rates of return in this interest rate environment uh, and they're locking them in for anywhere from 20 to 25 years. That's incredible. And that is not lost on the oil and gas industry. Uh, we hear a lot about jobs from the oil and gas industry. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about because it's kind of funny. Um, when we hear these glowing jobs numbers from the industry of 600,000 jobs and so forth, what they're get, where they're getting those numbers is from economic models. And anybody who's taken Economics 101 knows that you can essentially reverse engineer any economic model and have it say exactly what you want it to say at the end of the day. And that's exactly what they've done. And so what they do is they, they take the number of direct industry jobs and then they apply a multiplier to it. So let's say you have 200,000 direct industry jobs and we're going we're gonna to apply a multiplier of three to it and that's going to get us to the 600,000, right? Only when we went in and did some work on this, and others have done too, uh, and started parsing out what industry was considering indirect jobs, uh, they were including jobs like strippers and prostitutes in the mix. Now, admittedly, that's job creation, right? But it's not the sort of job creation that you or I think about when we hear President Obama say, we're going to create 600,000 jobs from shale gas. We certainly don't think that the President is talking about creating jobs for strippers and prostitutes. So, Going back to direct industry jobs, these are the jobs that um, these people strictly work for industry. These aren't outside peripheral jobs. Uh, and they're, a, a, to my mind, they're a better measurement. I took these figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And as you can see, oil and gas employs approximately 181,000. It's gone up a little bit since I, I pulled these numbers. But anyway, this is still roughly the same. Renewables. Uh, and I just included wind, solar, and geothermal in that, no other renewables. Uh, they employ approximately 183,000 people. Now, you've got equal number of jobs, roughly. But you can't stop there. You've got to look at how many jobs have been created per kilowatt generating capacity. And so I went in and checked that, and oil and gas accounts for about 45% of total kilowatt generating capacity, whereas renewables only count for about 15%. But do you see what's happened here? It means that renewables are creating significantly more jobs per kilowatt than oil and gas. I can promise you that is not lost on the oil and gas industry. That is why every time you turn on your television, I'm assuming it's the same here as it is in Texas, that you see these advertisements with the industry telling us how many jobs they've created. They know they're not keeping up with renewables, and they're trying to to just get it in everyone's mind that they are creating jobs when, in fact, they're, they're lagging significantly. So let's go into the majors again. So this is another thing that most people don't realize. The majors, and by that I'm talking about the big boys, the Exxon Mobiles, the Shell, the Chevrons, ConocoPhillips. The majors, without exception, without exception, have not been able to grow reserves in a meaningful way for over a decade. So when the SEC changed the rules and, and uh, broadened the definition of shale reserves, the majors saw that as an opportunity to go in and basically they're not finding any new oil and gas. They're just simply taking, um, they're taking from this pile over here and scooping it into their larger pile here. These aren't new reserves of oil and gas, but it makes it look like ExxonMobil is growing or Shell is growing their reserves because they bought them. More than 25% typically per annum uh, of reserve replacement for the majors for the last decade has been nothing but consolidation, buying other people's assets and scooping them into their bigger pile. So that's a little bit of a problem because it's showing us all that um, these companies are struggling to find significant new, um, uh, um, what am I trying to say, plays of hydrocarbon or fields of hydrocarbons. Um, the other interesting thing about the majors is that they've been doing a little bit of what I, 
it's perfectly legal, but I think it's a little bit of a counting sleight of hand in that they've been going in and buying back their own shares. Uh, this is Rex Tillerson of ExxonMobil, CEO of ExxonMobil, and they're a classic example. ExxonMobil, believe it or not, has been buying back their own shares to the tune of $5 billion per quarter for, for quite a number of years now. Now, why would you do that? Well, it's quite simple. It's, it goes back to those metrics I was talking about earlier with analysts. One of the other metrics that analysts or even investors look at is earnings per share. And so, if you're not growing your earnings in a robust manner, then the best way to counteract that is to buy back your shares so that now you have this earnings number and you're dividing it into a smaller number of shares which makes it look as though, on the surface of things, that you're growing your earnings. They're, they're on an upward trajectory when in fact your business may be sort of stagnating. Um, and that has been occurring with the majors. The other interesting thing, and this again, I'm going to give you an example from Exxon, is um, reserve replacements. Another primary metric, you look and see uh, because if you're an oil and gas company and you're not replacing your reserves on an annual basis in a meaningful way, then you're drawing down your capital essentially. I mean, it's, it's very simple. You, you've got to go in and replace what people are using or consuming, what you're selling off. So they announced their reserve replacement for 2012 and it was very, very interesting because um, they gave glowing uh, you know, language in the first paragraph or two. And then you got down into the meat of it, and they just threw out figures then. But I was sitting there trying to divide figures into other figures, and I realized suddenly that 40%, a full 40% of ExxonMobil's reserve replacement was coming from two shale plays. And I'm going to go into more detail on those plays in just a moment. But two shale plays. One of them was the Woodford, and the Woodford is done. I mean, it's down to two rigs now from 85. And the other one is the Bakken, and the Bakken is uh, touted as the poster child for shale oil. But interestingly enough, the per well production in the Bakken <coughs> peaked back in June of 2010. They've more than doubled the number of wells. We're going to go into that as well. That's what we refer to as the drilling <coughs> treadmill. They've more than doubled the number of wells since 2010, but per well production has not gone up. So you will see the Bakken peak very shortly. So you can see there's a problem for the majors. Um, recovery efficiencies for shales. Um, in conventional oil and gas fields, you could typically count on, traditionally, that you could pull out somewhere between uh, 75 and 80 percent of the gas or oil in place. With shales, we're finding that they're recovering approximately 6.5 percent. That's the average. It runs anywhere from 4 percent to 10 percent, depending on the play. 6.5 is the average. So the recovery efficiency is dismal. It's just awful. Um, energy return on energy invested. This is a quick ratio that we look at to see uh, how much energy are you expending to get energy out. So how many barrels of oil are you burning to get an X number of barrels out. And we write this as a ratio. So in the early days of crude, we expended one barrel of oil to get 100 barrels of crude out. Today, it's about one to get 11 barrels out. But when you start getting into these unconventionals like tar sands and shale oil, the numbers drop quite dramatically and they almost become not net energy efficient. So tar sands are running at three to one. They're still doing work on shale oil, but it looks like it's going to come in at about four to five to one, maybe even as low as three to one. So we, we now globally have a troubling dependence on um, low ER, OEI fuels, which means that we're expending a whole lot of energy to get very little in return. And what I'm trying to say to you here is um, that at some point, it, it just doesn't make sense any longer. <coughs> Excuse me. Externalities. This is something that the industry never wants to talk about, and it's something that politicians often don't want to hear, and they certainly don't want to deal with, but they become very real indeed. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I chose road damages for tonight. There are also health care costs, uh, health impact costs, there are agriculture costs, and so forth. These are the costs that um, are borne by the taxpayers and local, thank you so much, local municipalities uh, based on this heavy industrial uh, activity that's going on. So let's just look at road damages here. 
Uh, this figure for Texas is from 2012. Uh, industry likes to tell us about the severance tax revenue, and they brag and boast about it quite a lot, and they say we pay you know, a lot of money in severance taxes, and they do. The problem is the severance taxes don't cover the damage that they've done. Somebody's going to have to pick up the difference. So in the state of Texas, and this includes all oil and gas, onshore and offshore, not just shales, uh, the severance tax revenue was $3.6 billion in 2012, but the damage estimated by TxDOT uh, just from shale drilling around the state is $4 billion. So we've got a shortfall. By the way, all these numbers come from state comptrollers and state Department of Transportation. North Dakota revenue, $3.3 billion since 2010. Cumulatively, road damages from the Bakken, $7 billion. Uh, Arkansas, you've taken in $182 million since 2009, but your road damages are now estimated to be $450 million. Um, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was very foolish indeed. They wanted so badly for the drillers to come into Pennsylvania and start drilling in the Marcellus that they gave them a pass on severance taxes. They didn't even make them pay severance taxes. They finally wised up because they realized that they were on the wrong end of, of this deal. And in 2012, they, they started collecting what they call an impact fee. So far, they've taken in $204 million in their impact fee, but the road damages are, and this is just to, to maintain the existing roads, $3.5 billion from t uh, PennDOT. But they said to actually do it right and fix the roads, $7 billion. Somebody's going to pick that up, and I can tell you it isn't going to be the oil and gas companies. So essentially what these companies are doing is they're privatizing profits and socializing costs. Lack of confidence within the industry. That's been very interesting to me indeed. There are quite a number of examples. If you look in the Marcellus, um, Norse Energy put all of their assets up for sale in December of 2011. And, um, and they were supposed to have some of the best assets in the Marcellus. And by December of 2012, they still had no takers and they had to declare bankruptcy. And Sheets Exploration let all of their leases in the Marcellus expire. They just let it expire. They didn't think it was even worth fighting for them anymore. But the, my favorite is, because this one is, is most unusual, <clears throat> my favorite is out of the Bakken. Sorry, let me. In the Bakken, which is the poster child for shale oil, uh, one of the partners went in and they wanted to build a pipeline from the Bakken formation down to Cushing, Oklahoma. They couldn't get one single other entity to go in on it with them. Now, why is this strange? Because pipelines are cash cows. They are veritable money machines. They're very, very expensive uh, to build on the, so your upfront costs are very high. But once you have those costs um, paid for, you've got a money making machine, literally, for decades and decades to come. And um, they could not find one single other entity within the industry to go in on a pipeline with them out of the Bakken. Now why? It's very simple. Those wells are not long long. They're not going to last long enough. And so if you were to go in, well, if you look at the actual production history from the Bakken, and I'm not talking about operator projections, I'm talking about actual production history from the Bakken, we now know that the average Bakken well is its stripper well status by year six. It's ready to be abandoned by year six. Um, and so if you have a whole field full of wells that are depleting this rapidly, um, you're not going to have that commodity there for decades and decades to come, as the industry likes to say. Uh, and so it does not make sense. You can't make the numbers work on a pipeline. So they put a lot of spin on it, and they said, we're going to ship by rail. And that enables us to get the gas, or the oil, excuse me, where we want it to go. Well, that sounds good, and it's good PR. But the fact is that shipping by rail costs three times what a pipeline would cost. So if the commodity was going to be there for any length of time, you would definitely want to put a pipeline in. And they didn't want to do that. Um, if you want to look at the financial health of these companies, it's very, very interesting indeed. I could sit here all night and bore you with financial figures, but I'm going to do something very quick because it's simple and easy, and it's a, it's a good metric for anybody to look at. One of the first things I look at when I go into um, financial statements is the cash flow statement. And I look for free cash flow. And the reason I do that is because cash flow, just cash flow, you can massage and be extraordinarily creative with cash flow. You can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things with it and make it pretty much say what you want it to say to some extent. With free cash flow, on the other hand, it's very difficult. And it's much harder to fudge those numbers. So I always go in and look at free cash flow. So CapEx means capital expenditure. So let's take a look. 
I picked initially five companies, and I picked them because they were strictly <coughs> shale companies. And they only have onshore operations and only in shales. And so it's a lot harder to look at if you wanted to include somebody like an ExxonMobil or a Shell. They have operations all over the world, and it's hard to tease out the information that's just on shales. And I wanted to see what are the, the companies that just do shales. What are they? What do their numbers look like? What do their financials look like? As you can see, this is all their capital expenditure here. Since 2010, these five companies alone have spent $56 billion on capital expenditure drilling and completing wells. This is how much money they've made. None of them have broken even. Almost every one of them is deteriorated since 2010. It's going down. This one, Chesapeake, is very interesting because, as you can see, the free cash flow there was trending in the right direction and then took a nosedive again. And interestingly enough, in this area here, that's where they sold about $13 billion in assets. So um, there's a real problem here. You have a, a tremendous amount of expenditure. And, and I've since pulled the numbers on quite a number of other companies like Cabot, EOG, Incana. Um, some of those have other operations outside of shale, but still deteriorating cash flow across the board. So they're not making money. These are pad sites where I live. Each one of these red dots is a pad site with multiple wells on it. And I live right about there. Um, and so you can see it covers 23 counties in Texas. It's, it's pretty large. So the drilling treadmill. This is a classic example. I could sit here all night and give you example after example in every single shale plate of this very thing, but I decided to choose it from my own hometown. Um, in 2008, the city of Fort Worth received $50 million in gas drilling revenues on 44 wells. Sounds great, right? They were all telling us that we were going to be, no kidding, shale yonairs. That's what they called it. By 2012, and it had deteriorated pretty much in a straight line. We had a little blip in 2010, but pretty much uh, in a straight line, it had deteriorated. And the city received 23 million, but now we have 400 gas wells within the city proper. So we had a 50% decline, over 50% decline <clears throat> in revenues, but we had a tenfold growth in the number of wells. That is classic. That's classic. I mean, I could sit here and talk to you about this all night long. <coughs> and that's what happens with shales. They have not been able <coughs> to keep production stable for a meaningful period of time in any shale play today. The only shale play in the U.S., shale gas play in the U.S. that's still on a growth trajectory, and actually it's plateaued now, plateaued about six months ago, is the Marcellus. So we expect to see that because it usually will plateau for about six to eight months and then you start seeing it decline. Every other shale play is in decline. Now the industry will tell you, well, that's because the price went down. That is only, that does not account for all of this. It does not account for a tenfold growth in wells and not being able to even keep um, revenues, even with a tenfold growth in wells. See, the numbers don't work. So um, it's a little bit problematic. Um, if you look at the production of all the shale plays in the U.S., industry would have to drill 7,000 new wells per annum at a cost of $42 billion, and those numbers will rise each year because they have to move out of the sweet spots and into more marginal acreage. 7,000 wells, $42 billion per annum, just to keep production flat. That's beyond the capacity of the industry at present. So, as you can see, it's, it's, it's a problem. This is a satellite picture of the Bakken Formation. The Bakken Formation is out in the middle of nowhere. These are <coughs> natural gas flares because the price of natural gas has dropped so low that the industry deems it unprofitable to even take the gas, so they're just burning it off. Now, I think there's a very good argument to be made there that that is irresponsible use of, of our natural resources. Um, it's enough production to power all the homes in Chicago and Washington for a year. This is the Eagle Ford in South Texas. Again, you're out in the middle of the Chihuahua Desert, essentially. It looks like a city. And again, those are just natural gas flares. We're the only first world country that still allows flaring. Um, it's an antiquated process and should not be allowed, but it is being allowed, and they are wasting um, natural gas in, at an incredible rate. Um, so, why don't I open up to questions now? Uh, I was wondering if you've done any work on Southwestern Energy and how it compared with the, any of these? Uh, yes, I'm glad you asked. I meant to bring that up. I'm so sorry. Um, 
Southwestern Energy and Chesapeake Energy, two big players in the Fayetteville. Uh, in investor presentations, they touted that the average EUR, and you don't really, that means average estimated ultimate recovery, which is the reserve for uh, wells in the Fayetteville. Just remember these numbers. The average number for Chesapeake was 2.6 BCF, billion cubic feet, and Southwestern claimed, I think it was 2.3. Um, interestingly enough, when you go in and pull the production history from the Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission, you find that there's never been a single well in the Fayetteville play that will surpass 1.7 BCF. Most of them, the average is 0.5. So these companies were telling investors, we're getting averages on these wells of 2.6 and 2.3, when in fact they were getting averages of 0.5. We found that across the board in every shale play. Um, what we found when we pulled the actual production history from the various states was that operators, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I don't know. Operators have overestimated reserves by a minimum of 100%, and in some places as much as 4 to 500%. Uh, why did they do that? Because they could go in, they could book those, because of the rule change from the SEC, they could book those reserves immediately and borrow monies on them. So we now know that there's been a tremendous amount of money, I, I couldn't tell you an exact dollar figure, but there's been an enormous sum of money that has been borrowed on shale assets that either do not exist or will never be commercially viable to extract. It's a little bit of a problem. So I'm glad you asked that question. I meant to bring that up in my talk. Yes, sir. Where were the regulators all the time that the, the uh, reserves were being sold off? Um, well, the reserves being sold off. I'm not sure well, what you mean by that. Well, they were saying that basically they were taking write-offs by buying the reserves. You know, the... Uh, no, they... They, they bought the assets, then they had to write, write them down because they right. paid too much Where for them. Where were the regulators when that was being done? You're saying that that was an illegal... Uh, no, that's not illegal. Off? That's not illegal. No, no, sir, okay. that's not illegal. That's just stupid yeah, if you're managing by the oil and gas. There's nothing illegal about it. It's I just... Stupid like they were. No, I didn't mean it that way. That's, okay. if, the last thing you want as management of any company is an impairment charge. You don't want to write down assets. And um, so what it says is when you have a company like BHP Billiton that goes in and pays $4 billion and a mere 18 months later they write off over 50%, what that immediately tells everyone is that you did not do your due diligence very well. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> the mergers and acquisitions, by the way, um, <clears throat> the M&A, mergers and acquisitions, the deals, the shale deals, that had been generating all this fee income for the investment banks, they have now taken a plunge. Uh, the first six months of 2013, uh, M&A deals are off 52%. The private equity money that was going into it, so the hedge funds and other private equity groups, that was going into shales has dropped off over 90% year over year. Um, so this income generation for the banks is, has fallen off dramatically, which tells me, um, I'm going out on a limb here, I'm, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I sort of do, if, if you're not making money, you're going to be looking for the next greatest thing. And um, so I suspect that's exactly what the banks are doing right now. They're looking for the next shales. Um, and these companies are beginning to scramble for money. I'm seeing some very interesting um, um, projects, let's say, coming out of the companies to raise money. <laughs> the wind farm that was put in northwest Iowa, talking to, I think it was Cal Energy that put it there. And I said, why would you invest in it if you're not getting a return for the amount of money it costs to invest? He said it was strictly due to the fact that the government backed the whole thing. So, okay, is your point that... Well, I mean, where, where is wind energy at 8%? I mean, we're talking the amount of I mean, if this goes bad, as you say it's going to go bad, how long do you think wind energy is going to pick up the slack? Okay, I'm not Am sure. I, I think I know where you're going here, but let me, let me back up, because I think there are a couple of points that ought to be made here. First of all, um, there's, there's a lot in the uh, mainstream press about renewables getting subsidies, and indeed they do, but they do not get subsidized anywhere near what oil and gas gets subsidized globally. Oil and gas is one of the largest subsidized um, entities on the planet. 
if you take it globally, I mean, in the U.S. and globally. Uh, so the amount of monies um, that are going into subsidies for renewables are, are I think, one-sixth of what the oil and gas industry gets in subsidies. One-sixth. So even though we may hear a lot from, from uh, the mainstream media about, oh, you know, renewables are bad because they're being subsidized, well, nobody's being subsidized as much as the oil and gas industry. And in fact, they trot out the Rex Tillersons of the world and make them testify before the Senate um, every couple of years to explain why they still need these subsidies and they, they you know, it's just all uh, a big kind of circus and nice shows. So I wanted to get that out of the way because um, uh, renewables are subsidized and indeed they need to be subsidized in my opinion because we need to make, and, and I think this is, I'm hoping the second part of what I'm about to say is going to answer your question or, or statement. The reason I do this is because, and the reason I, I really am interested in shales is because I saw something that I, well, I saw two things. I saw shareholder destruction. And with my background, I'm a former investment banker and I, I, I was a financial consultant for years. I'm sick of, of shareholders getting screwed, basically. I'm tired of it. And we need financial reform and we didn't get it with Dodd-Frank. It was so watered down, it, it just, we didn't get it. Okay, so that's one reason I'm standing up here tonight. The other reason is, and you don't have to even talk about climate change, you don't have to talk about, I don't even want to talk about that, I want to set all that stuff aside. The point is, hydrocarbons are finite. There's no way around that. We can argue, if you want, whether it, we run out next week or, or 100 years from now. It really doesn't matter. We're going to run out. So, if, you're, if the bedrock of the entire global economic system is energy, which it is, um, how do you make a transition from moving away from a, a, that, a, a bedrock based on a commodity that is finite and is going to run out at some time. How do you do that in, with the most stability and the least amount of disruption? In my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong, but in my opinion, um, you do it by taking some of those subsidies that we're giving to the fossil fuel industry and you start pouring them into R&D for renewables. That would make a huge difference. Like then you use things like shale gas instead of exporting shale gas. And I didn't get into exportation of shale gas, and, and I can, I'm certainly willing to talk more about that if you guys are interested. Um, instead of exporting our shale gas to China, and the reason they want to do that is for the spreads. It's to save ailing balance sheets. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, they can extract pipe, refine, and ship that gas to Asia for $9 and get paid $18. Here they're getting paid $3.50 for the same amount of gas. So it's just business, and that's the way it should be. It's just business. But, it's, but don't wrap yourself in a red, white, and blue flag and, you know, it's called energy independence, because that's just, that's just rubbish. That's just playing well into the uh, current political environment. But it has no basis in reality. So how do we make that transition and make it as smooth as possible? Well, you do it with pouring money into renewables, R&D, maybe there's other things. Maybe there is cold fusion. I don't know. Now they're saying, MIT's telling us that, um, that there may be something to that, and it's based on the quantum, mechanic le quantum mechanical level. I'm not smart enough to go into that. But, um, so we need to be looking at research and development of other things. And then we need to use that shale gas, instead of shipping it to China to grow the, the Asian economy, we need to use it here, and we need to use it as a price buffer. So if the wind isn't blowing and the sun's not shining and you need to keep that price stability in utility generation prices, you can do it with shale gas. That's how it ought to be used, in my opinion. Um, can you talk a little bit about the economics of wet versus dry gas? Um, well, yeah. Okay, so dry gas is, um, is well, let's, let's see, but wet gas. Wet gas is natural gas that has uh, natural gas liquids included. So you have ethane, propane, other things like that. Now, interestingly enough, when they started to tank the price for dry gas, um, they immediately, a lot of companies like Range Resources, for instance, um, they came out and said, well, we're going into NGLs, natural gas liquids, and, um, and therefore we're going you know, to do really well. Well, they didn't do really well because they did the exact same thing with wet gas that they did with dry gas. They drove the price into the ground. Now, why did they do that? That was the question I kept asking in the very beginning. I was like, I don't understand why you guys aren't shutting in these wells. And nobody had a good answer for me. Because traditionally, 
in order to stabilize prices, an oil and gas company would shut in production. They would just wait, let the price stable, and go on. These companies, when I pulled the financial statements for the first time, I recognized why they weren't shutting in. They weren't shutting in because they were too highly leveraged and they had absolutely no cash. Usually oil and gas companies are cash cows. They sit on a mountain of cash. These companies did not, these shale companies. And so they were drilling to meet um, debt service, essentially. They could not meet debt service without keeping this production going. And they were also drilling to meet production targets. And when you're doing that, then you just keep drilling and drilling and drilling, and, and it just drives the price right into the ground. They did the same thing with NGLs. So now you have an NGL market that's very, very cheap indeed. Um, so I don't know if that covers what you were asking, but you know. I wanted to have you maybe address a little bit more. You mentioned twice that um, because of the favorable, favorable business climate, the shale and the drillers are um, exempt from all major federal environmental statutes. Would you talk about that a little bit more? I'd like to share this information and I'd like to be able to defend it. Yeah. Um, the oil and gas industry is exempt from all major environmental statutes in this country. They're exempt from clean air, clean drinking water. They're exempt from everything. Um, and the CERCLA Act, in fact, that's kind of interesting. If they weren't exempt from the CERCLA Act, every one of these pad sites has the potential, depending on which chemicals they use, to be a Superfund site. Every single pad site has the potential, depending on the chemicals that they use. But they're exempt from the CERCLA Act. So somebody's going to have to clean that up someday. Because, um, and it ain't going to be the oil and gas companies, almost certainly. So um, that's another external cost. Um, in 2005, I think it was, uh, Dick Cheney, they, it, it, it's known as the Halliburton loophole, and they changed some of the laws. And I'm trying to think what it was called. Does anybody know? Can anybody remember? Energy Policy Act. Yeah. Energy Policy Act. I think that was it. Yeah. And um, it, it made a very, it, it created a very, very favorable climate for oil and gas. And I think they saw shales on the horizon, and they wanted to set the stage to make it as easy as possible to go in because clearly there was going to be a problem. You know, here's an interesting um, aside about, about this. Uh, clean drinking water and shales. We hear a lot about water, and I, I don't want to go into the environmental aspects of water, but this is interesting. George Mitchell was the father of fracking, so to speak. It, he was Mitchell Energy, and uh, his company was Mitchell Energy. And um, he died about, I don't know, four months ago, I guess, quite elderly man, about 94 years of age. And George Mitchell, um, his foundation, the head of his foundation, actually wrote an op-ed which was published in my hometown paper, and it was very, very interesting, and I would encourage all of you to go and pull it off the internet. Fort Worth Star-Telegram, George Mitchell op-ed. Um, because he basically said, this isn't being done the way it ought to be done, and they are not protecting the drinking water the way it ought to be protected. And I think, I don't have any proof of this, I did not talk to Mr. Mitchell before he died, but I think that he was an older man who felt like, oh my God, this is going to be my legacy. And he saw a problem. And so he started speaking out about it in the last months of his life. And I found that very poignant, actually. Um, but yes, they're exempt from every major environmental statute in the country. You know, and I think we've actually done them a disservice, frankly. Um, because if you go out to an oil and gas site, they haven't had to modernize the way other industries have modernized. And everybody, you know, I've got friends in the petrochemical industry, and they talk about, oh, yeah, you know, we, we bitch and complain. Sorry, but that's what they say. We bitch and complain every time they say they're going to give us new rules. But then you know what we do? We go back and we start thinking about it, and we start thinking, I can beat this. I can make this work. Or not beat it, but I can make this work. I can make money doing it this way. And then they've raised the bar a little bit higher and a little bit higher. We've not made the oil and gas industry do that. And so if you go out to a drill site, yeah, you'll see some fancy new, you know, I mean, hydrofracking, the, the actual horizontal drilling is new technology, and it's pretty impressive. It's, it's darned impressive. But seismic, it's, it's relatively new technology. But other than that, they haven't done much for the last 40 years. I mean, the pad sites, like you saw the picture up there with the frack trucks. It, it's a heavy industrial site, and, and there's diesel smoke billowing out everywhere. And they could use electric drill rigs. They won't use them because the margins are too thin on shales, and they've never made money, so they won't use the pollution control devices. EPA actually estimates 
that most pollution control devices for shales uh, would pay for themselves in less than a year. The industry won't use them. America has made a habit of going to other countries and um, setting up their energy operations. Would you discuss uh, what is happening now with the companies coming to America and the selling of the assets like Chesapeake and the, um, the leases for, in Arkansas in particular? Uh, and what company and what nation they are from and the various nations that are now invested in the U.S. and how that's changing the whole dynamic of our ownership in this country. I don't know, I've got, I think I found some of these numbers and we can go back to that, but I don't know um, exactly how much, I don't think anybody knows exactly how much the foreign investment has been in shales. A lot of foreign nationals came in and bought up shale assets. Uh, the Norwegians, the French, um, the Koreans, the Chinese, um, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. And they have uh, purchased shale assets in virtually every play. Um, they have also, there's also been a lot that has been done in off-balance sheet financing. So it's very difficult to know exactly a percentage number, I certainly don't know it, for the total assets that are, are owned by foreign interests at the moment in shales. Um, I'm not sure anybody really knows it because if you recall, that's what brought Chesapeake down was the 1. Billion, or 1.1 billion in um, off balance sheet financing and the loans that the analysts didn't know existed. That was all, uh, a, a lot of that was foreign investment and they didn't know it existed. So um, there's a great deal. Um, I'm trying to think in the Barnett, I think most of the assets in the Barnett have now been flipped. All of the major players, Chesapeake, Range, Devon, well, Devon's still there a little bit, but um, most of the major players, EOG, they're gone. They're completely gone out of the Barnett. They flipped the assets, and uh, quite a number of those have gone to, um, I'm trying to think, they've gone to the French in the Barnett, they've gone to the Chinese. Um, so there's, there's a huge amount of shale assets that have actually been purchased in the last couple of years. Uh, by sovereign wealth funds and um, actual uh, uh, oil and gas companies, international oil and gas companies. The uh, treadmill that you described, uh, the, the drilling that has to keep up to maintain production quotas and mm -hmm. to support the balance sheets and so on, sounds like a Ponzi scheme. And uh, usually at the end, somebody pays. So who's, who's going to wind up paying when the music stops in this case? And, there isn't enough gas to really pump up. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think already the people that are paying are the people invested in pension funds. And to go back to the gentleman's um, comment earlier, um, just because a pension fund has a manager doesn't mean he's necessarily very good at his job. Uh, you, you know, if that were the case, then we never should have had the meltdown with the mortgage-backed securities crisis. Uh, we should never have a down market in that case. Um, so the logic behind that is certainly flawed. Um, as far as, um, sorry, tell me, what was your, the other part of your question again? Who's going to pay at the end? Oh, yeah. When the music stops. Um, it, the problem that we have with shale gas exportation is that um, we are locking ourselves into long-term contracts on a commodity that depletes at breathtaking rates. And that's going to be problematic. One of two things is going to happen. I mean, either they're going to default on the contracts because they simply can't keep up the production enough, or the international pricing pressure from um, just the higher prices in Asia and Europe, will, will, they will, there's no doubt, I mean, everybody's in agreement of that, they will exert pricing pressure on our domestic price and it will go up. So if it goes up high enough, then it will make it cost effective for them to drill. The economics will work, but it has to go pretty high indeed. The average break-even cost for shales is about seven fifty to eight dollars. Um, so it's got to go above that to make most shale plates work. If it does go above that, then the economics do work, and then it'll be Katie bar the door. They're going to be drilling everywhere in order to fill these contracts that are going to China. Um, and then you've got you know you've got significant environmental degradation, and you still don't get away from that drilling treadmill. You still don't get away from the fact that you can't keep revenue stable, you have to just keep this frenzy of drilling up all the time. Uh, and as they move out from the sweet spots into more marginal acres, they're going to have to drill 
Like when you get, you start out here in a sweet spot, when you get out here into the more marginal acreage, you may be drilling two, maybe three wells just to equal the production from one well in the sweet spot. That's the problem with this. That's why they can't keep production stable for any meaningful period of time. The oil companies are at a profit margin of uh, anywhere from 8, 9, 10, 11 percent a year. And that's very low compared to most companies. Uh, and their income is large due to the fact that they're so big. Is that true? Well, it depends. Okay, when you start talking about profit margins, what are you exactly talking about? Because it depends on how you massage a balance sheet. Well, basically that's true. But the profit margin that is, uh, what, sales divided by income. And that gives you a profit margin that most companies, I understand, utilize to see where they're standing at. And as my understanding, like uh, the uh, industry, there's well, that's why I. Some most of them make. Free cash flow. Well, how much money do you have? To 20 to 25%. How, how much do you, how much cash do you have at the end of the day? I mean, if you're a business or you're a family, how much cash do you have at the end of the day? Well, that's what I'm saying. They have you, uh, they have a lot of cash, but compared to their, you know. But they don't the have a lot of cash. Right See, that was that was my point with this free cash flow. They don't. It's been deteriorating. Well, that's it's where negative. I'm, that's it's not even positive, it's negative. Um, and that was this right there. For how this long is all, has this been going on? This has been going on since 2010. I just drew, drew these okay. numbers since 2010. Okay. You can go back to 2007. If you go back to 2007, they haven't had a problem. If you take, take a universe of 37 different companies involved in shales, they haven't had a single um, uh, quarter, profitable quarter for free cash flow. So that's why, I mean, when you start getting into things, you can, you can play around with balance sheets so much and you can make them say whatever you want them to say. But the bottom line is, do you have any money left at the end of the day? And that's why I look at free cash flow. And in that case, as you can see, it's been deteriorating. It's been going down. 2010, 11, 12, 10, 11, 12, 10, 11, 12, 10, 11, 12. And this is break even that line across there. And so um, there, it's deteriorating. It's not getting better, it's getting worse as time goes by. So, anybody else? <coughs>